All right, so the date is November 20th, 2018. The time is 11.52 a.m. And I'm here in Bethpage, New York with Vincent A. Romano, a World War II veteran. So thank you, Vincent, for agreeing to uh, do this today, to do this interview with me today. Um, I'm sure everybody who is going to watch this um, it also appreciates you taking the time out of your day um, to answer uh, questions about your life and your service during World War II. So I know I already introduced you um, earlier, but if you could just go ahead and state your name and your date of birth. If you could say your name and date of birth, Vincent. Sure. Name is Vincent A. Romano. A, a is Anthony, uh, a saint I always pray for. And uh, my age is, I'm 92 years old. I'm going to be 93 in a couple of months. And um, I'm still in half fair, half fair health, not the best health, but I'm fair health. And I, uh, I'm, it's a wonderful life if you live this long, you know. Yeah, and can you just go ahead and say what your date of birth what date of birth is? Yeah, the date of birth is two seventeen twenty six. Wow! So February seventeenth, nineteen twenty six. That's correct. And you, what were your parents' names? The parent, my my mother's name was Rosalie. My father's name was Andrew. Very nice. <laughs> and uh, where were you born? My father was born in Sicily, served in World War I for the Italian government and the Allies, if you remember. And my mother was born in Sicily, and she came here in, uh, 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 when she was four years old. She, we have the, uh, the shipping record mm -hmm. where she passed to Ellis Island with my grandmother. Mm -hmm. And she was, she became one of the students in a, in a, she was teaching children how to speak English because she knew both languages. She grew up with my grandmother knew Italian and she knew, and she was an expert in the English language. She got very interested in it, you know, she, so she spoke very, very nice English, beautiful English. And uh, we grew up that way. I have a sister by the name of Madeline, and she's four years younger than me. And that was our family, my father, my mother, my, f my sister, and myself. And where did you grow up? Grew up in, uh, <clears throat> I was born in New York City, right? Smack in the middle of the Midtown, like uh, 64th, 63rd Street or 62nd Street in New York, uh, in Manhattan between 1st and 2nd Avenue. I think the address was 364, something like that. Mm -hmm. And uh, right across the street was a church, a, ch uh, a Catholic church, Roman Catholic church, Our Lady of Peace. And about five years old, six, four years old, five years old, we, we, I, we moved to Astoria, Long Island. It was like a country in those days. It was like uh, something we we didn't see in Manhattan. Open lots, open open areas, and we were lived in on Twenty First Street, Twenty Three Fifteen, Twenty First Street, and uh, we uh, we lived there. And then my grandmother moved there, and her family. And we, we sort of had a joining, an adjoining house. I, uh, I had two uncles, Matthew and Joseph, and I had uh, three aunts, Francis, Madeline, and Mary. My grandmother's name was Rosalie. Rosalie, and uh, we loved it. We loved the story. And suddenly, we had to move. They came with a... a, a Petitions that we had to move because they were going to build the Triborough Bridge. And we were living exactly where one of the stanchions is today, where one of those big stanchions holds the bridge up, concrete stanchions. Went to school in PS7. Uh, Tony Bennett was one of my schoolmates. And uh, I had a teacher in third grade, 
She was a redheaded teacher. So her name was Miss Patrick. And her niece was Ethel Berman. Merman. <laughs> Ethel Berman. Really? Berman. Yeah. <laughs> and she used to tout her she used to tout her off to us and say, Tell your mother to go down and go to see my my uh, niece down in Broadway. You know, she's on Broadway, she's in the movies, she's and it was a it was a great uh, experience, you know. We lived near a river, and we and uh, when we moved from there, we went to a, we had to move from there, so we went to Twenty Fourth Street. We lived there for about I guess seven years, six seven years. And my aunts, uh, two aunts, mercy on their souls, God have mercy on their souls, they uh, got infected with TB. Which was pre was very prevalent in those days. Every lot, a lot of people were catching it. You know, there was no smoking involved and nothing. They just and so they passed away from. Two, I lost two hands that way. The other hand worked for Saks Fifth Avenue. Her name was Frances, and she uh, <laughs> and she was a uh, she had a nice job with Saks Fifth Avenue. And she she was like a. a Store boss, you know. And uh, my my uncle Matthew was a s cab driver for New York in New York City in Manhattan. He loved the job. He 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 uh, used to meet notables, you know, and stars, and movie stars, and everything. He loved the job. My other uncle worked for uh, I forget the name of the. The uh, hotel he worked with, but it was for all models. All uh, young young girls were going to be models. You know, they lived in this lived in this special hotel there. Most of them did, and uh, he was just like a so uh, a short order cook, and he made a nice little living. You know. We all worked in the family. Work was our motto in our family. As soon as you got of age, you went to work. Twelve years old, I was pushing a, a push cart in Manhattan, delivering orders, delivering fruit and vegetables to uh, the Ritz Towers and Delmonico's and uh, all over the city. I even went to I even went to the uh, the big one on 59th Street and parked there for 59th. What a, all, all the actors and actresses I used to see. I saw Basil Rathbone there, and I saw. I saw some of the, the high high food of, of, of that time, of that era, you know. Wow. And uh, when I got to, uh, I remember when uh, when uh, I was a great baseball fan, and my uncle used to, my uncle Matthew used to take me up there once. Every time he get a chance, we go up and see Joe DiMaggio, which was so oh, big thing in those days, right? And Lou Gehrig, and and, and I actually saw. Babe Ruth played once because when I was six years old, he was standing right in front of me. Well, he was backwards to me, but I was in the bleachers and he was right in front of me. So I watched Babe Ruth play ball. And uh, it was a very, very exciting, uh, you know, being young in those days. It was very exciting because a lot of things were going. And then 1941, whatever, Japanese. Uh, bomb Pearl Lava. You remember um, what you were doing that day? Somebody, yes, I was watching. Uh, my my cousin and I, just about six months younger than I was, we were listening to a radio show. It was on in the afternoon, and uh, I think it was about around noontime sometime. I'm not sure the time, but we were we were joking and, and we were playing games. He had some kind of a thing where you molded lead. Soldiers and stuff, and Japanese were born for a while. And uh, my my uh, one of my cousins was one of the first guys in. His name was Sam Lucchese. He went to uh, he he was sent to Governor's Island as a clerk because that was his business under when he was a, uh, a civilian. My other cousin, his brother was working for uh, Fairchild in those days. It was an uh, airplane factory or something. 
and the other the other fellow, it was about uh, 16, 17, maybe. And then we came of age, and he became he went into the navy. So we had a navy, air corps, and army so far. And then when I <laughs> then I got drafted, it was in the month of May fourth. I graduated the Newtown High School, and uh, what year a couple was that? months, I didn't know what to do because I was in the middle of, I don't know if I was going to get drafted or not, I didn't know anything, but I, I was drafted on May 4th, 1944, and my, uh, and uh, my mother never thought I'd pass the physical, but I did, because I was very thin, I was very thin, and, and uh, Went in the army, I got drafted, went down to Grand Central Plaza, and uh, on the train down and in, in the Grand Central Plaza, was, <laughs> Jackie Gleason was, dra was drafted with us, but I never saw him again after that. So he, <laughs> he must have got he must have got good soap. And what else I see? And then I uh, went in the army. I went to. I, I can still, to this day, when we were drafted and we were sent to Camp Upton, I, to this day I can still hear some of the moans and crying from grown-ups. I, I said, some of these men were grown-ups and they were crying, sobbing, never been away from home because in those days nobody traveled much, you know. And uh, I did a little KP, two, two days of KP there. And the next thing you know, I was on my way to uh, Camp Croft, South Carolina. I got down there in, uh, in the month of, uh, it was in May, about May 15th. And uh, in South Carolina, it was beautiful, it was nice and warm. And we did our tr uh, basic training there. Uh, met a couple of nice fellas there from New York, you know, we had was pretty nice. We didn't uh, we didn't fool around much. We didn't have any money really to spend. So from there, I got a delaying route they called it in those days. When we finished our basic training, we got a delaying route. We went home and we stayed home. I mean, our activities were at home for uh, for ten days. Then we had a report to uh, Mississippi. And uh, I'm trying to think of the name of the camp now. I can't think of the name, but it was uh, uh, right near uh, Hattiesburg. And the name of the, the name of the camp was Camp Shelby, Camp Shelby, Mississippi. And we uh, we we uh, trained to, as a unit. And when we got there, I thought, we, I, I surmised we were training for uh, the Pacific Theater of Operations because we did a lot of uh, uh, activities in the, in the warm weather and the swampy, swampy mosquito-ridden places, you know. And uh, we became a, a nice unit, a pretty nice unit, close unit. I met a lot of fellows there. I, I, my friend was uh, Lenny Barbello, and he was from uh, Manhattan. His, his brother was Rocky Graziano, He's a, who later on won the world, uh, middleweight title. And uh, what unit, when you went to Camp Shelby, what unit um, were you yeah, in? Camp, yeah, and Camp Shelby was uh, strictly training, training long hikes. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, and I, like I said, we, we, I think we were training more for the Pacific Theater. And then all of a sudden there was some kind of an emergency happened. I was supposed to go to a, uh, an automotive training school, because that's, that was my, that was my, gonna be my, uh, you know, job when I, got, when I got out of school. I was learning to be an automotive technician. I liked the electrical work. And uh, from there, I went to. Uh, for, uh, we got. Uh, I think it was. 
the month of September, yes, yeah, September of 44. I was invited to a, a football game in New Jersey, Rutgers, and they gave us free passes, free tickets, and a bunch of us went down to the football game. When we came back, we were hit with the beautiful news that we were going overseas. <laughs> so, so we packed up and we were ready to go overseas. We went to Camp Kilmer, New Jersey. Camp Kilmer in September, and uh, <laughs> and and uh, I got pulled out of the line because one of the officers noticed that I had a broken tooth in my in my mouth. The top right part of my tooth was broke. He says, "You can't go overseas like that." I said, "What are you talking about?" I said, "This is my unit. I'm." I have to go with it. No, no, he says, you don't go that way. He says, you can't go. So he says, maybe a miracle will occur, uh, will occur because you got about 24 hours before you're sailing. He says, you're going to report to this place tomorrow morning. They're going to pull the tooth and give you another tooth. All in one day. I says, I never heard of it, but it happened. They gave me a gold tooth. I had it. <laughs> 18 years old, I had a gold tooth in my mouth. <laughs> so anyway, worked, got on a ship, and in those days they had what they call victory ships. They were like they were like little little tubs in in a bathtub, you know what I mean? Oh, boy, what a what a ride that was! It took us, I think it was sixteen days, to go from New, from Camp Kilma to. England. 16 days going zigzags. One day was hot, the next day was cold, the next day it was this way, the next. I said, what's happening? And the guy says, we're going zigzag. He says, to get away from the submarines. He says, they had the submarines. And we made it. I mean, in that little tub that we were in, we made it. And we went to a town called Basingstoke. Now that town, that <laughs> That place was a mushroom farm. And we, as a unit, our company, Company L, 273rd, were assigned to that town and we were gonna clean out, uh, we cleaned that whole place out. The mushroom farm was no longer a mushroom farm, became to be a barracks like it. And uh, we were tr still training. We were marching at night through the towns. You could hear us marching through the small towns in England. And they were inviting us to dinners. Uh, the people were marvelous in, in England. They were absolutely the best. They invited us to dinners. They, uh, it was like for about a month or so, or two months. It was like the month of uh, November. It was like around uh, Thanksgiving time. And they, uh, they had started to make uh, Christmas things. They love, they, love, they love Christmas, I think, as much as we do. They had taken parachutes, and we, we were dressing up some of the walls they have there. It was going to be like a big dance, and everybody was anticipating the war was going to be over. And we were going to be, everybody was saying, you guys are going to be occupational troops. You're going to be occupational troops. Don't worry about it. Okay. So, all of a sudden, it was like, um, December the, I, I guess it was December, again about the 7th, I, I don't know, was it was December the 7th, around that time. And uh, the Germans broke through the lines in, the, in, in some of our, uh, the Allied lines in, in, uh, in uh, Belgium. Yeah, that was um, December sixteenth. Yeah. Happened. Yeah. Yeah. And they pushed uh, they pushed our guys out of the way and and were, were heading for France again. Oh boy! So first thing they did was take half of our unit, our whole division, took half of the division, and sent them as as replacement troops. And what division was that? And we were going to get our us, our uh, troops, we were, they were going to supplant them with more troops from the States, I guess, or whatever. Mm -hmm. So 
So some half of our troops were, were going to the front, and there were, I guess, three or four divisions involved that that were were replacing some of the men that we were losing at the bulge because we had a, we suffered a lot of, a lot of casualties there, well, an awful lot of casualties. And then uh, we got the we got the replacements. Now we have run over as a unit. And we and <laughs> I saw it in the movies, but I never thought it was going to happen to me. We went from uh, Southampton. We went first. We went to Southampton, and from Southampton we went to um, uh, La Havre on a. I think I'm almost positive it was a. Uh, uh, Norwegian boat, <laughs> and, they, and they gave us cans of sardines to eat. <laughs> and for the keys to open the tents, <laughs> that was a big massacre of <laughs> stabbing, stabbing the cans open. You know, so we had something to eat. <laughs> and we got, and we got to, uh, we got to La Havre. And uh, here we go. I said, this only happens in the movies. Guy said, no, no, it's happening right now, my boy. He said, there were two tough sergeants there. They said, you got a choice. You, they had a chute that went from the ship to the land, you know, to, and you landed. But you had to carry your, your stuff with you. You had two bags mm -hmm. and your rifle. And you had to slide down the chute and go into the other, or you could climb down the ropes. You know, the, the side of the rope, the rope. Mm -hmm. yeah. So we started with that. So uh, I decided I wanted to go on the ropes. And the guy says to me, you can't go down the ropes. He said, <laughs> for sure you'll go right to the bottom of the English Channel. <laughs> he says, get in that chute. I said, I get, I, you know, he says, get in the chute, don't worry about it. Boom, he gave me a push and boom, right at him. <laughs> I was done. I'm in France and I don't know it. <laughs> so anyway, we got the, they got us all together again at the bottom. And we went to a place, I forget the name of the town in, in France. It was a small town out of Le Havre. What was your impression of Le Havre when you arrived? Pardon me? What was your impression of Le Havre when you arrived? Le Havre was half destroyed. And like, the, you know, the, the harbor was... It's still un uh, workable, but it was half of it was destroyed. And we got down, and uh, they they took they took us uh, by truck to a place called uh, uh, it's a small town in France, where the train where the train depot was. There was a train depot, and I didn't think I'd ever see this day when I. You know, I heard about it when they, in World War One, where they crowded all those people into those, uh, and they used to call it, I think, a cow train or something like that. But they jammed us into those. Oh, the, cat, the cattle cars. Cattle cars, I think. Like cattle cars, exactly. You mm -hmm. couldn't hardly breathe. I'm telling you, that God's on truth. truth. Couldn't breathe. You breathe, and the guy next to you <laughs> would breathe for you. And we got on. Uh, we we went to uh, uh, one of the big cities, uh, Soissons, Soissons, and that was like an army depot. There. They had they had established a big big depot. So we went to Soissons, and then we got all new equipment. And some of the equipment we had was for summertime. Some you know, so they switched it around, and we got new equipment. We got new. Uh, uh, what kind of equipment were boots you? Boots and everything, everything new. Yeah. What kind of equipment were you issued? We were issued um, something new, which was combat boots. Up to that time, we were still had leggings. They used to have the leggings for the for the study. Yeah. And up to we were issued combat boots. Oh, with the buckles. With the buckle, two buckles on the side. Mm -hmm. And uh, and a little heavier materials like uh, the the blankets were nice thick wool blankets and stuff, because it was getting to be uh, winter, you know? Yep. And we, um, 
wool caps and sweaters and everything was wool. It was good, comfortable feeling. Yeah. Then we went from there to, uh, we got on the trains, Sassons. Then from Sassons, we got on trucks again. And we were, we were sent to St. Fitt by truck. I didn't even know, I never knew or heard of St. Fitt my whole life. How long was the journey by truck? It was, uh, I remember like it was maybe two or three days because we were traveling and, and as we traveled along, we would detour and we actually saw dwarf deer running in the woods. The little dwarf deer they have there, you know, and the guys were shooting at them. I, I was stupid. I said, what the hell are you, you know, but they, that's what they wanted to do. And then we got to uh, St. Vit, and that's where the, a big, com a big com conflagration of Mixture, a mixture, and I, I, I never saw before in my life. There was no, no kind of a, so no semblance of order. Everything was still mishmash. We had guys from uh, 36th Division of Texas. We had, a, we had guys from uh, uh, some British, British outfits. Uh, guys with the hobnail boots. Oh man. You heard them coming from four miles. I said, I, I mean, <laughs> but they did it. And uh, then we had the guys from the Air Force that would, they, they, they actually pushed them, put them in the infantry to push them in. This guy, some of them guys were going to shock, you know, they come there, what the hell what were you were going they? Ahead? What were they, pilots or were they like? I don't know what they just were. Guys they in, were. Just guys in the Air Force. Air Force patches, you know, that's all I knew. We spoke to some of the, some of the guys. That 36th Division from Texas took some beating, the way, the way the guy was telling me, because we were all, it was a big mixture now. A big, it's and a big we were mess. all talking about things. And, and the 82nd Airborne guys that were up in Holland and everything, they pushed them down in, into Belgium. And, and so they were in St. Vith too? 101st, I think, was there too, but I don't know if they were close to us or not. But mm -hmm. I, I saw some of the fellas, 101, some were 82nd. They all had the patches. Yeah. They told me they, they were all identified by the patches and, they, and some of them by the drawl. Some of them, some of them guys from Texas, I couldn't understand them for, for nothing. <laughs> and uh, made friends with a couple of them. And we were all on the front lines. That's it. You, you're in that hole, you're in that hole, you're in that hole, you're in that hole. Hey, you know, the MPs were placing us in certain places. You're going in that hole. So we managed to stay together for a while, uh, Bello and I, for a long time. And uh, this guy, Angelosi, from Philadelphia. And we, got a, we met a guy from the Air Force, a curly hair guy with a uh, nice solid build. And one of the one of the men that we did meet, I made I made good friends with him. His, his last name was James, and he was from Minnesota. Mm -hmm. Now this guy had four children, and he was in the army. They drafted him in the army with four children. I became very close with him because he was a much older, not much older, but he was older than I was, you know. And he made a lot of sense when he talked and he spoke. And uh, so we went. To, we went as a unit, but we had these ancillary, ancillary guys all around us. Yeah, you know. And then we started our push. So did you arrive as replacements? You what? and did you and the guys you were with when you arrived in Lahar? Did you arrive as replacements? Yeah. For other yeah, units. Sure, sure. We all, we all, you know, met. Uh, but, uh, my guys were still around, but we, we got mi mixed up with uh, other people. They were throwing them into our outfit. Like, but, oh, so you were already in what division? Yeah. What, yeah. You, what division was it that you were in? The 69th? I was in the 69th division, and we were Company L, 273rd, but we stayed together. Mm -hmm. And they, they joined us, like, and then for a while they were with us, and then they, as we uh, started our push, suddenly they... They took them back or did something with them and gave us fresh troops from the States. Hmm. And we pushed from uh, from St. Fitz. 
We went to some forest. I don't know the name of that forest. I don't think it's on that. And uh, it's like a, a dense woods. And uh, we went through the woods, and then one night uh, we we assembled. It was the end of the. It was like the an end of the forest, the where the forest is ends, and. The MPs came, MPs with flashlights, and they called us by company, uh, by company or by, you know, whatever squad they called, it. and they showed us where our positions were going to be in the woods, in the outside of the woods, and we were going to, you stay here until you get further orders. And you dig a hole. And you dig a hole, and they, that's going to be your permanent spot for until you hear from us. Then we dug in. We all do. We dug in, and you know, you could see the other fellow, like it's, it's like a zigzag thing, you know. And uh, we stayed there for about oh, good part of the fall, the winter. It was winter now, and it was snowing. And everybody said, "Don't worry, we're going to be moving any day now, and all that stuff." And the air force is going to, but the planes couldn't fly. The weather was so bad. They said, that, "They said that the Germans had a, had a secret weapon, and that, that they they were make they were actually making the weather. They were so foggy that the planes couldn't fly." And I couldn't believe it. No, so what happened? We we all dug in. And some of us had, uh, I had one, somebody else had, we had the uh, pocket, uh, pockets, what do they call those white? Not pockets, was it pocket? The the snow parkers? The, yeah, the you know the white snow, mm -hmm. it's, snow it's like a snow uh, thing. Like, but so now, now we're white, uh, we're, we're, we're blending with the snow, it started to snow. Now we don't know who the, who the guy over there is. I don't know who that guy is over there, you don't know who I am, you know. <laughs> You're afraid to say anything. <laughs> Where'd you get those from? The park is. Did they just gave them? The army just gave them to you. Or? <laughs> so all we did was to communicate was to go make believe you're coughing or make believe. All right, Joe, how you doing? <laughs> and you just see the guy turn around. You know he was a what? It was a, it was a tricky thing for a while. That lasted a while. Maybe. Five, Ten days, eight days, or something like that. Well, yeah, there's no way of telling, you know. And that outside that forest. Yeah, you don't have no cal you know a calendar. You don't have anything, no yeah. sense of time. And, <laughs> and so uh, we stayed there until we uh, got orders orders to march, and that was um, to order it out of the holes, and that was like the month of January. And. Uh, Skies start to open up, and if you looked up, you could see nothing but Allied planes, Americans and British planes. You look, they were different levels, and they were on their way to Berlin or wherever, and they were bombing the crap out of those guys. You know? well, were, what were a lot of the reactions to the guys like you, yourself, and your buddies? When you, what were you guys feeling when you looked up and saw all those planes yes, flying over it? Yes, all you saw was airplanes. All you saw was one one level and then the next level and, and then another level. And you look straight up, you saw the higher guy. You know? they were, I don't know how many thousands of planes must have been in the air. Was it a good feeling seeing all those American and British planes American going and off? British, American and British. Wow. And that started our push, when we started pushing. And we started, we, the first place we went in was uh, into Germany, and we went to the, uh, pushed our way into Bonn. Was that your, where you first saw combat yourself? What? Is that where you first saw combat, near Bonn? Yeah. Okay. And Bonn, Bonn was our, uh, but you know what we, we had to go through first before we got to Bonn? We had to go find a way to get through the Siegfried Line. Now the Siegfried Line was a design by some cuckoo. Who must must have thought he was a spider or something, because he had it was spread, it was spread out like, you know, like a, a web. Mm -hmm. One 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 uh, 
place would be guarding two places and two places would be guarding four places and that guy and, and the food was delivered to this place and if you went down and, and it was all uh, uh, what you call there uh, all the uh, ditches you know yeah trenches mm -hmm. and we went through trenches from uh, from one place to another but we couldn't penetrate the the bunkers, the bunkers were. So somebody came up with an idea that we're going to do like they did in Japan. We're going to we're going to uh, use the uh, the flamethrowers, squirt guns there. <laughs> Although the flame flamethrowers, the flamethrowers. They were going to use flamethrowers. So we, I was with the uh, one guy, uh, one set, uh, group, and it, and my friend was with the other ones, and they says we're going to try to just flamethrowers. I wasn't a flamethrower, I was a backup man. But they had this guy, he, he knew, supposedly knew how to use us. So we went there and we they tried to... Flamethrowers didn't, first of all, the flamethrowers didn't do anything. Because they didn't, there was nothing to burn there. It was dirt and, and concrete, the, the, the concrete was over 18 inches thick. Mm -hmm. And the, the doors were, made of steel, and they were like six inches of steel doors. I gotta get, get in here. So the guy says, well, listen, you know, uh, one of the officers there, we all sat down, thought of, they were thinking it over, and they says, they got, they got to find a way to eat and get food to them and go to the bathroom. And he says, so, so it's happening. He says, well, we just got to find a way to disrupt it. And they did. They got what they call Bangalore torpedoes, and they showed us how to make a pipe. It's a pipe joint, really. Yes. Yeah. And they they hooked two pieces of pipe together, or three, and when it got uh, t uh, dynamite in it or whatever it is, gunpowder, and that's what we did. We laid the we laid the pipes, and where we laid them was right by the steel doors. We laid it right at the bottom of the street and up the sides if we could. You know, you had to crawl and go and get up there through the trenches. Mm -hmm. And then we used to, listen, used to listen to the, for a clinking, clanking noise. That we, yep. Okay, so now we were, we, we, would, uh, we finally figured out how to break and get to, to the bump, uh, bunkers. And when we did that, all the bunkers went because we were blowing the doors off every bunker there was. And as soon as you blow the bunker, the Germans would surrender because they, 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 they were trapped. They were trapped in, actually in their own bunker. And that's what happened. So we broke through the Siegfried Line, which was a, a, a you know, a, it was an impossibility, but it happened. And we broke through the Siegfried Line and then we started and the first steps were into Germany. Now we were really in Germany. We went down and the first city we went to was Bonn. And we we captured Bonn and the, the fellow, uh, I told you about the guy, he <laughs> went in and played the piano. <laughs> went to this place, it was a beautiful, beautiful thing. I don't know what it was, an arena or whatever it was, or a, or a, a a stage place where they had plays or something, but it was a beautiful place. And my first sergeant was a piano player. You go to the tank and we're going, we're waiting for orders. I said, oh, right, what do you need playing? <laughs> Your first sergeant started playing the piano. <laughs> and is that you know, while... Hey, my little buddy, not a sweet. <laughs> is that while there was shooting going on outside or... What? Is that there? Is that while there was shooting going on outside? Or? Yeah, yeah. The fighting was going on. We were, you know, we're waiting for orders. I, we're going to go this way. You're going to go that way. Hey, I'll be right with you. Blah, 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 blah. <laughs> Could you describe? Um... Well, anyway, we got out of the, out of bond right away because uh, and because they said that the Germans were at Remagen mm -hmm. and they were going to. They were going to drop German paratroopers. I never heard of German paratroopers, did you? They said they're going to come with German paratroopers to defend the bridge. Because the bridge was the Romagan Bridge. That's the one where the supplies were supposed to come 
well, we were going to capture it, but they they had rigged it with uh, explosives. They were going to blow it up. So we were going to go go and try and, and get through that. So we did. We went to Remagen, and we as we saw well, as we were crossing uh, in rubber rubber boats, <laughs> rubber boats. <laughs> I think I, I still think I was sitting in water all the way, but that's okay. But While crossing the Rhine, I got the other the side. <laughs> it's all I cared about, and and to our left, to our left, uh, which would be the west, the eastern side, the western side, was uh, the the who, who were those guys that build the bridges? The engineers. The engineers, the engineering outfit was was trying to rig up something to cross. The Elbe, uh, the, the Rhine River, so that uh, you can get across, you know, so our trucks and everything, we get all our motorized equipment, you know, so the tanks and all. Could you describe um, the, the combat that you saw while you were in Bonn and crossing the, the Rhine River? Yeah. Could you, like, just, like, just elaborate a little bit on, like, what yeah, you, we, you were going we, up we against? Collaborate, you know, it was a big collaboration there. They, they, everybody knew what they, what they had to do and where they were going, but to get across the Rhine River was the trick. Well, the trick was, how the heck do you get across this thing, you know? Mm -hmm. So now that's where the engineers come up, but it was going to take too long because we had all this, all our equipment, all our motorized equipment, all ready to go, and there was no, no place to go. Where do you go in the water? You know, you can't. Yeah. So we had to get across, try to secure the bridge, which was already tr rigged with dy with uh, explosives. They were going to blow the bridge up, and they tried to blow it, and it didn't go down. If, I don't know if you remember that. The, yeah. The, the Romagan Bridge stayed right up, and we got across. We secured the bridge. The engineers were still working on that thing, but our equipment was going over. Over the Remagen, the old Remagen Bridge. So you were there at the battle for the for the bridge. Oh yeah, we were right there, there at the shore to protect the bridge. We were protecting the bridge, and uh, like I said, they said the German pirate troopers were coming and this and that. And, uh, nothing like that ever occurred. And we got all, a lot of the equipment across, and then finally the creaky bridge started to creak and creak. Boom. Some part of it fell down. It's from the explosive that they had exploded. They, they, uh, you know, they detonated it about three days before that. And in the meantime, our guys were going across, and finally the bridge went down. Yeah. But we had quite a bit of stuff over there already, and we got to go uh, Koblenz, across the Rhine River. We went to Koblenz, and when we got to Koblenz, the Third Army was. It was right next to us, mm -hmm. the, the Patton's army. Yep. They were to our right, and we were in Koblenz. Then from Koblenz, we went up Castle Road, they called it. There's, there's a part of Germany when you cross the Rhine River that all the big old, old castles were, and they called it Castle Row. And the name of the the city, when you get to the top of it, is Castles, K-A-S-S-E-L-O. And that's where we went. We went right up uh, a castle road to Castle. We, we uh, got into some skirmishes around Mulder, Fulda. I remember uh, capturing guys. We, we broke into a, a, a German pre-ex. Uh, we we opened the doors and we told the people to help themselves come on in. They, they had all kinds of uh, uniforms there. One guy was putting on German. I said, "You put on a German uniform, you're getting out of gay. You're gonna get your butt shot off, you know." And uh, it was pretty thing. Then all of a sudden we were in uh, Fulda or Mulda, and we're capturing these guys. Now we got the guys and we look. The MPs come, they take the prisoners, and now we're, we're stuck. Where, where the hell did the guys go? Where did the guys go? We don't know. So we just kept trudging along, and finally we caught up to our uh, unit the uh, next day. Like, you know? I, I said, so lucky we caught you guys. We're stopping to death. Get out of the way when going to eat. And we got across to them, and we got up to Castle, and from ca when we got to Castle, we met British troops up there. 
They were in our, that was, I guess they were from, it must have been in Holland, I think. So when we met the British troops, we veered a, they had a meeting there, the, the, all the brains, I guess they were. And uh, we we went, made a, uh, like a, uh, a turn. It was like a right angle turn. And, and the British were, were on our left, and then the second armored division was in between us. So I was wondering what we were going to do next. I said, where do we go from here, the guy says, you're going to keep going east, east, east. That's when I knew where we were going. We were heading for Berlin. We were, we were heading for Berlin, and so were the British, and so, were, so was the second army. So we went and we traveled, uh, we got the Alzengreuz, uh, a couple of those places, we lost, we lost some nice guys there, you know, a lot could of you, troops. Could you describe the battle around Alzengreuz and what it was? Alzengreuz, yeah. We lost a lot of troops there, 69th Division lost a lot of troops there. Especially our, uh, our regiment, 273rd, and uh, I think they changed command, our, co our command, and everything there, you know, because it was like an, an entirely new outfit. And that was where they had the the anti aircraft. What? The at Alton Groitz, that's where all the anti aircraft. Yeah, that was it. That was it. That was. That's where uh, it was a. Um, Alton Groitz was the. Uh, you might call it the center of the anti-aircraft units of uh, that that were firing up at all the planes that were heading for Berlin. That was their stop. As soon as they got near Alton Gorge, they knocked a lot of planes out of the air. Those. They had hundreds of them, hundreds. Of them. And we got there in, uh, in Alton Gorge, they, they leveled their uh, anti-aircraft guns at us. And they used them for uh, used them for anti personnel. We lost a lot of troops, a lot of guys. Nine, two of my first, best friends, a guy by the name of Williams, and the other guy whose name was Clarence Ogden. And we used to always kid him, kid him about his name. I call Clarence. <laughs> okay, it was a nice man, a good kid, and uh, we lost a lot of guys. That's why they. My sergeant told me, go across that field and I say, yeah, all right. You know, the <laughs> Where's everybody? So I went across the field to a farm at Altengoitz, and it was a dairy farm. And they had rutabakas there. Rutabakas and piles in the field so that the animals would have something to eat in the winter time, you know? And uh, I used them to my advantage. I, I zigzagged across that thing. I still don't know to this day how I did it. I was running. I don't think Jesse Owens could have caught me. <laughs> I ran across that field. And uh, there was three of us, or four of us left. That was it. Well, were, you try were, we, were you trying to capture something going across that field? Where were you... Uh the Germans were oh, shooting the Germans. us. Yeah, yeah, they were shooting us. It was not not gonna hell out of us all now. And uh, this guy, uh, I never saw. Yeah, I never saw that staff sergeant again after that. Must have, might have got hurt or killed or something. And I never saw uh, the piano player anymore. Hmm. And anyway, we uh, we get across the field, and I see this beautiful. It looked like a big, long garage, but all glass. It was all glass and immaculate tile. And there, it was a place where they, they must have milked the cows in there, but there was no cows, you know. But it was beautiful, spotless. And uh, there was a house there. When I got down to the end of the, the thing there, the three of us, we went down the slope of the bon of the farm. You know, the farms are, when you build a farm, they, they're higher, it's higher than the, than the right level of the streets, you know? Mm -hmm. And we came, we came down the slope, and we saw this house in there. And we went to the house. We broke in the door, well, not broke in, we jumped, just went in the door, looked around, there's nobody there. 
and uh, we hear rustling. We hear noises in the house, you know. And uh, uh, Angel Olsey says, I'm, I'm gonna, I'll, I'll go upstairs. He says, we're looking, we're looking for eye company, like that sergeant had told us to look for, her. eye company, look for eye company, look for eye company. So he goes upstairs, and as he goes upstairs, a shell hits the top. It hits the top of the roof. And I see, I see Angel Ozzy coming down, and I like a boom, 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 and he was wood, heavy, you know. We were, I was, in the meantime, I'm looking the opposite way. I'm looking in the basement, because that's where I hear the rustling. Mm -hmm. and, and the other guy, Barbaro's by the door. I open the door to the basement there. <laughs> it was about eight or nine elderly people sitting there, sitting like this on a bench. And it was like a closet, you know, like a closet door. Yeah. And they were all sitting there, and they were out of the way of the war, I guess. They, were, they weren't saying anything or nothing, you know. Mm -hmm. I asked them, you know, soldiers gone. They didn't understand, you know. Yeah. But they told us that no soldiers, no guns, no nothing. They had to believe them because I, I practically searched the whole house. We looked it all over. And Angelosi got hurt. Now we don't really don't know what the hell to do. So it was me and Barbello left. And uh, go outside. I go back to the bar I go back to the barn where the milking place was. I'm looking for some kind of help. You know, some kind of, I couldn't find anybody. I'm kneeling down on one leg, on one knee, and uh, I says, you know what, let me go back into that house and see what the hell's going on. So I get up and I had to go to move and right where I was, right, right where I was uh, kneeling down, I see two bullet holes, marks there. Yeah. One here and one here. Somebody must have shot at me and missed me. <laughs> <laughs> I was lucky, I tell you. So I got all the way back, and uh, I go. I see Barbello there. I says, Angelo. He says, uh, Dan his name was Danny. And he says, no, he, he seems to be all right. He seems to be all right. And as we're talking, we hear rumble. Oh, 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 big, something big is coming. And I says, oh shit, these are Germans, we're fixing that food now. So, they came, it's American troops. And the guy stops the column, the guy gets out, what are you guys doing here? Where, where's your outfit? Where? I said, we don't know. We don't know where they went. We're looking for I Company, it's, uh, 69th Division. Well, we're going into uh, Altengorch, the guy says. They had uh, 90 millimeter uh, guns, these guys, uh, traveling uh, uh, artillery they were, whatever. And they said, we're gonna, but you guys stay here, don't, we're, we're gonna have uh, uh, some people here, you know, to fix a place for them to eat, because the next day they were gonna go in. They saved our lives. Uh -huh. Angel Ozzy was the last day I ever saw him. He was all right, but he was moving, but he, he went. And then Barbello and I were the only two left. And then something happened. I heard something rumble, and that was blotto for me. I was out like a light. I didn't know what happened. Same thing with uh, Barbello. I don't know what happened to him, maybe. But it must have been, I'm just guessing now, Something must have hit around there, and and the, uh, the trauma of the, or whatever they call it there. And I went out like a light. The next thing I know, I'm laying down. I I have <laughs> a GI blanket over me, and I'm laying down. I'm saying, what the hell, am I dead? You know, is it, am I dead now or what? I don't know, I'm afraid to move. I look over and I see my bolo's got the same thing. 
here comes a lieutenant. I look up. I don't even say anything. He gives me this on my feet. I'm up both of my feet. Bang, bang. He kicks me in both feet. Hey, soldier. <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> I can't get up to salute him. And I said, he says, stay where you are. Stay where you are. He says to me, my name is Kabutsky, something like that. And he does the same thing to Barbello. He wakes him up. He says, how you guys feeling? I said, I, I, I don't know. I said, I, I don't know what the hell I'm doing here. I don't even know what happened. So he says, he says you probably, uh, from the noise or something, you went out from the shells, you know. So <laughs> I go like this. I got blood on my hand. Oh, jeez. I says, I... Feel a little more, and I got a, uh, somebody put a handkerchief or something in there, and I was bleeding from my left side of my head. Here. So the guy says, You hurt? I said, No, I don't feel nothing. I'm numb, I said, I feel numb. So he goes away. This guy's gonna have some breakfast or something. He says, Something to eat. Because we're going, we're gonna leave in a while. We'll leave. I can't even stand up. He said, no, you'll be all right. He said, get up. So I, said, I got up. Moved this arm, moved that arm. I said, yeah, you're fine. Babalo says, yeah, I'm all right. He says, okay, you two guys just volunteered. <laughs> I swear to God. I, I couldn't believe it. He would just volunteered to be the, 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 the scouts, for the, the scouts or what the hell was it? The eyes and ears of the scouting division for, for the 69th division or something like that. You know, so I said, are you kidding me? He said to me, no. <laughs> we were left there with, the, with this unit that was the uh, the scouting division, the scouting unit for the 69th division, the forward unit, like, you know? Mm -hmm. <laughs> See, we, we had lucky. <laughs> I just, we just saw the Barbello. I think we jumped out of the fire. We were right in the frying pan now. <laughs> He's laughing when I'm laughing. With, I said, at least we can laugh. Now. I said, we'll do what they do. I said, we'll leave with them. Yeah, yeah. Said, we had no outfit. We had nothing. So we go with him. We go. He says, you get on there. And he tells Barbolo, you get in that Jeep. John. He says, yeah, in the back, in the back. You know, they got a little skinny thing. <laughs> he got the back seat. And I, he says to me, you get on that thing. And I was an armored car, you know, the armored cars they had. I rode on them before. So he said, you go, grab that, grab that. I said, yeah. And, I, and we go with them. Now we're going. And we started to go. We're taking town after town, capturing town after town after town. We go to the, the white sheets again with the thing. You know, everything's fine. My, my head didn't bother me, nothing. I said, oh, Jesus, it's great, you know. He said, ah, it's only a scratch. It's only a scratch. I said, okay. So we kept going. And <laughs> the next thing you know, we're on our way to Leipzig. I never heard of this place. The guy said, Leipzig, that's a big city, big city. When we get to Leipzig, our division comes there too. I said, oh, thank God. I said, so we're back with our division. The guy said, no, <laughs> you're still with our unit. He says, forget about the division. You guys are with our unit. You're with the scouting unit. <laughs> I can't get out of this. So we get to, we get to with Leipzig. The guy looks up, there's a big tower there, a big gigantic, it looked like a big light, you know them lighthouses they have, the big one? Mm -hmm. This was a big tower. And they're looking up at the tower, and, was, and uh, oh, they gave it up, they gave it up. The, the officers uh, that came down with, two, they, you know, the guys with the flag, they came, they came over and they talked, and they, all, 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 all of a sudden we hear brrr, a German burp guns going on. I said, son of a bitch, he, he's the guy that said it was all over. Right? 
It's not all over, pal. So uh, that really burned the guy, uh, the, the guy who was in charge. I think he was a major. I'm not sure. It might have been a captain major or something. He called the unit over. The guys with the 90s. <laughs> That tower wasn't a tower, it was very long, man. They blasted that place, and and all of a sudden the white flags come out again. He says, can we believe it this time? What do you think, fellas? I got blown up past <laughs> you know. But they let him come down again, and this time he really gave up. So that was the official taking of, of uh, Leipzig. Leipzig. Now, when we left Leipzig, now we we met our unit and everything. We got it together with the guys and all. That's where some of the little pictures and things were. He said, we're going, we're heading uh, this way and you guys are, are heading that way. And I said, and the second armament is in there again. And uh, they're going just straight through and we're going, we're making a right turn. I went, what the hell are we making a right turn? Our outfit's going that way. He says, they're going to Berlin. <laughs> he says, we're going to go south. We're going south now. And that's when we followed the Elbe River down. And we were still taking towns, little towns. We we uh, freed a couple of those uh, uh, prison camps. Freed a lot of a lot of beautiful people there. The POW there camps. Every kind of people that you can imagine. Every kind that you can imagine. We had... We had... Uh, Gurkhas, Sikhs, Moroccans, Indians, Greeks, um, you name it, it was in there. In the prison camps. Canadians, troops, all in the prison camps. Uh, Canadians, Italians, French, all in these camps. And it's, so uh, we were going, you know, we we're trying to be nice guys. We, I trying to be. I mean, we try to help them out. They give you a bar, chocolate, this and that. And they, all of a sudden, we see these uh, uh, ambulances come. Medics, a lot of medics, a lot of ambulance. They're going over to the guys and checking their pulses, I guess, or whatever they're doing. And they said, "You don't feed these people." He says, "You're gonna kill them." He says, "They haven't had food in so long." He says, if you give them food, he said, the food will kill them. That's what they told us. The guy from, the guy from uh, Canada, we had a couple of guys from Canada. One guy from Canada, he says, I don't care what you tell me, I got to eat something. He says, to me. And he, he ate, I, well, they did what he had to do, but they took them all away, you know. And these were regular prisoner of war camps for captured yeah. soldiers? Yeah, these were all, all the prisoners that were in that camp. So when we got, we made that right turn and went down along the Yelp River there, that's when we saw, uh, that's when we freed all the places. Now one of the places was, I, I always, I always say it's candies. Uh, candy, no, not candy, so. Brandeis, you ever have Brandeis, Germany? Brandeis, Germany was, uh, when we finished all those little towns, we took a lot of towns. Uh, they, every time we came to that, uh, this guy, this Kabuchi, I think his name was Kabucha, who was from Alaska, was in charge of this, uh, of, of uh, uh, the scouting outfit. He says, he used to tell us what to do, and every time he got here, I'm going right to the Bergermeister. If you don't put your white flags out, we're going to level this town. Now, how could you level that town when the biggest thing we had was a 37 millimeter cut, a little tank, you know the tanks that they used in the, in the desert water? In All the little armored cars, those? Sherman, yeah. the Sherman tanks with the 37 millimeter. What the hell are you gonna do with that? I said, that's a pea shooter. <laughs> How come like I, you don't? You don't bring all your contraband out here and get, you don't do this, you don't have, we're gonna level the town. <laughs> You're gonna level it with what? I was saying to myself, the guy's crazy. But he, he got the message, of course, you know, we captured a lot of town. And then the, we went down along the Elbe and then we went to Brandeis. When we got to Brandeis, 
uh, he says to us, okay, you guys did a wonderful job. He gave us a ball of bologna. You guys did a good job, a good job, and, uh, and uh, you earned your rest. He says, you pick out any house you want here, and you go to sleep in there, and we're gonna, we're gonna do the guard duty. He says, you guys did enough. So we went in there with muddy shoes, and everything. <laughs> plopped down on all beautiful beds and everything, and it just rested till the morning. In the morning we got up, and we had our breakfast, and I felt good. I'm walking down, and we're walking now, and he's riding, and we're walking, and nice and easy down the road. And it was a morning where it was a lot of uh, dew, you know, that real wet mornings, you know. and. Uh, Cobblestone roads, slip and slide, and walking and walking. I see a sign, side of the road, Torga. I never heard of Torga. That's not even German. I said, that's, it's like a, a, a Polish, or Czechoslovakian, Torga. I said, Russian. We looked at the town. I was alongside the. Uh, right alongside of the uh, kibbutz, and he says to me, "You know what?" It, he says, "We're going to go straight into the town." He says, "I don't think there's a soul in there." I've been looking. He says, "With the binoculars, there's not a soul in this town." I said, "Okay." We're walking right in. The the, the uh, vehicles are all around us, and we're walking in. And he says. The roadway went like uh, to the right, all cobblestone, right up to the entrance to the, to the town was all cobblestone. He says to me, I don't see anybody moving, do you? I said, I, don't know. I looked, I said, I don't see a soul. Out of the corner of my eye, I see a little movement. It looks like a man, like from here. Uh, maybe two or three hundred yards away. There's a guy. I said, it's a man up there. I see him go in and out. It's it's a house with the with the uh, with like the roof with a piece cut off. You know, the roof was blown away. And. Uh, He's walking in, and, uh, and uh, now I, I go around the other way a little bit, and I see him. He's got a pulley, a rope and a pulley, and he's he's taking the furniture from the house, and he's putting it on. Uh, he drops it up with the rope, and he's lowered it into those uh, honey wagons. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. They have in Germany. They have the, the wide, the big wide uh, honey, and he's lowering the furniture into it. He said, "This son of." His son of a gun, I said, he's stealing the furniture. And I look, I see he's got boots on. I said, this guy's German? Maybe not. I don't know. I says, what do you think? So, so Gabuzzi looks at me and he goes, I think we got ourselves a cook. I said, yeah, but what the heck is he doing? He's just stealing all the furniture. What else he going to do with it? Not even, not even two minutes later, he's put, he's finished dropping that piece into the wagon and now he's putting his tunic on. And when he put the tunic on, he said, I said, he's Russian. He looks at me, he says, he's a Russian. They were a Russian. I said, this is it. I mean, the friggin' war's over, you know? And he looks at me, he says, I think what is. He took his hat off, he threw it up in the air, I think what this is it. So that was your that was your first encounter with the Russians, you see that one was stealing the furniture. First time we met a Russian eye to eye. Can you imagine that? He's stealing furniture. It was a what a nice feeling that was, you know. It was real, it was a great feeling. What was it the war zone? What was your first impression of the Russians when you met up with them? This guy comes down, he, 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 we were very careful. He told me, look, you can't start a war, World War III now. And I said, no, I'm not going to shoot the guy. He, says, he said, to me, I'm not either, so let's be nice. So he came down to us. He came down to, of course, we, you know, we hailed him. Like, we were going, hey, hey, oh, oh, you know. 
come down, come down, come down. He didn't understand this, but he came down anyway. He put his tunic on, he came down. And when he came down, he was walking toward us. I said, I don't trust, he goes, don't start World War III. I just cool, cool, he didn't say cooler, but he says, nice, be nice. I said, okay. But he kept walking toward us, and he didn't understand what we were saying, and he's talking Russian, I don't know where he, he's, he, I can't understand nothing. So uh, we're getting closer, and uh, in my cartridge belt, I always carried my cigarettes. I used to smoke them. I take out a pack of camels, camel cigarettes. Mm -hmm. And I says, I showed him the cigarettes. American, ah, he goes, ah, Marikonsky. And he starts jumping up and down, you know, oh, what are you doing? Ah, that, 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 that. And this guy starts jumping up and down, uh, Kabutsky too, he's going, it's a Russian, it's a Russian. And, and he goes, I'm going to get this guy, Freinach. He says, he's a Polish guy, but he speaks Russian. I mean, he understands Russian. So he gets Franak. Franak was from St. Louis, and he was a, 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 a drugstore guy. He worked in a drugstore in St. Louis, Missouri, but he was a Polish. But he understood the guy, and they started talking. And the first thing I know, they pat each other on the back, and you know, we start jumping around. The guys we were all with, whoa, 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 you know, it's a, what a feeling that was, I tell you. It's like, yeah, you were carrying 20 pounds of lead, and then all of a sudden it just dropped off here, you know? <laughs> and uh, he, they walked off together. Uh, Franak and this uh, this guy. And, and Kabuski's going, where the hell are you guys going? A big guy in the white, you know? He kind of came around with him. So he says, he's going to take me to the other side of the uh, the, 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 bridge, uh, the river. They have a small bridge that the Germans were coming over. That was the Elba River? Uh, getting away from the Russians, getting away from the Russians, getting away from the Russians. They had uh, elderly people in baby carriages. They were pushing them over, uh, you know, pushing a baby carriage over the bridge so that they could get to the, the safe ground. And they, but there was nobody going in that town. So we went, while they were doing that, we were, when I went, Myself and the two or three of the other guys went through the, through the whole town. There really was nobody there. They were afraid that the Russians were going to take that town. They were going to, you know, those, people were afraid of the Russians. And that's uh, almost it. And then after that, the, uh, as you'll see on that on the tape, they all got together and uh, they had women in the army. Russian right. woman, strong. Oh, one come one or, the, <laughs> one or two of the guys were trying to dance with them. Oh, <laughs> the guy said, "I'll kill you." Get <laughs> and uh, it ended. Uh, it was a beautiful, happy ending. It was really so. We, that was it. And we met the Russians, and that was it. And that was April the twenty fourth or fifth. I don't know. We didn't have a camera. I mean, a calendar. I think it was like April 24th or 25th. And they got, they met, and uh, Freinach brought the women over, some, some of the Russian soldiers from the whatever they were, whatever they were, and uh, they started their uh, dancing, drink, they had vodka, you know, and all mm -hmm. that stuff. I, mean, I, I was, I was just, just so glad it was over. I just went in the corner like a couple of guys there. We were all sent. I think it's over. I think it's over. And that's what happened. So then uh, they uh, they had uh, like a meeting, and first guy to come, Andy Rooney. You remember Andy Rooney? Mm -hmm. He was with uh, Stars and Stripes, I think, or something. And and he came. Somebody from Life magazine was there. And they all started to interview everybody. I said, I don't want to, I ducked out of the way. I don't want, you know, I don't want no more of this, you know. I don't want to get involved with anything. And uh, Kabutsi and I and another couple of guys you who know, walked away. You know. 
one that enjoyed us, so we're looking for food, really. Those Germans had cellars. Every cellar had potatoes. Potatoes and potatoes and potatoes. So we used to get the potatoes, and they had the, the grease or whatever the heck they used, and we had to make French fries. <laughs> you know, how many, how many geese, you know, the, the Germans were great for raising geese. They used the feathers and, and all that stuff, you know. <laughs> Guys were good. <laughs> uh, the, what day they were. Wonderful. And so, what there? was what was it like when the official word came when Germany finally officially when surrendered? We, what, was, what? what was the reaction in your unit? Oh, when, the unit. When, we, the, yeah, when, when, when the, the regular was, unit caught up with us, there was a, oh, it was it was uh, just too much. It was everybody was going crazy. The Russians, you're going to see the, the, the people were dancing, the guys mm -hmm. were dancing. It's a little guy. One of the replacements that came was his name was McCain. McLean. He comes in and he says, uh, uh, you in the Boy Scouts or what? He's a little guy. He's, like, he's so small. He's a young guy, a Boy Scout. He's why you're a tough guy. <laughs> I, was, <laughs> I was 139 pounds. <laughs> and uh, we made friends, you know. They caught up with us and we went back to our outfit. He yeah. said, you guys can go back to your outfit. I said, yeah, yeah, thanks a lot. <laughs> From that scout, you let the scouting outfit went back to your old one. Yeah, and now we, now we go back to the old baloney. You know? It was good, it was good. Was um, just really quick, um, um, did you use, by any chance, um, with your, you had an M1 rifle. I have to right? get close, I don't hear. You had an M1 rifle. Oh, yeah. Did you, use, did you ever use... Um, the black-tipped ammunition while you were fighting the bulge, the armor-piercing? No. Rounds, you never used any of that? No. no. I, had a, I had an M1, but I also had like two pistols on me. Oh, time, really? You know. And um, did you ever see, um, have air support, like see the P-47 Thunderbolts coming in and oh, yeah. to provide air support? When, when, you know what they used to go for mostly around the railroad yards? They oh, yeah? They were always blowing up around the railroad yards. Stay away from the railroad yards. Because you know, the Air Force was blasting. Air, Air Force was blasting away all the time. There yeah. were so many planes in there. You have no idea. If you if you wanted to count the planes, you couldn't count them. It's impossible. That's how many planes. And could you just... They were really so good support for us, you know. Yeah. It's, uh, only with the exception, only with that time when it was snowing. There was a haze. They like couldn't get off. a fog off. and a haze there that just wouldn't lift. It was like... Day after day after day, you were walking around, you didn't know if the guy over there, was, hey, I don't, you know, nobody wanted to talk to each other because you didn't know who the heck the guy was over there. Yeah. It, that was the only time, but otherwise the Air Force was there for support. They were yeah. always there. Yeah, they couldn't, they couldn't take off in that cloud that would have been too dangerous. Well, I, don't, I don't think we could have done anything without the Air Force. Yeah. I mean, I could have done that good without the Air Force, especially after the bulge. And could you describe what life was like in Germany during occupation duty after the war was over? Do we what? At what life was like in Germany during occupation? What you experienced while you were occupying? Oh yeah, yeah. Germany. All right. So then, uh, what, what happened after that? We uh, we were sent back to our unit, and we had um, uh, a part, uh, not a party, a uh, a gathering, you might say. And we were told that we were going to start training again and going to school because we were going to be the army of occupation in Europe. Mm -hmm. I said, oh, that sounds good, you know. So we started that and they started sending us to school. And I was learning German. I, I, I actually started to understand everything and talk back to them and everything, you know. And uh, about, I guess it was, Summer, spring was coming and summer was coming. It might have been. It was getting warm. I know that. I guess it was. Well, it was oh, it was April when we were. So it might have been the month of May, around around in that time. You know, May or June or whatever. That's when we we were going back into training. 
Mm-hmm. We, were, we were marching every day. We were uh, going on uh, field trips, you know, 20 miles, 18 miles, and uh, kept uh, kept our uh, our guns oiled and everything uh, oiled up. Did you think you were did clean? You, did you think you were being sent to the Pacific? Yeah, that's what, well, we didn't think we were going to go to the Pacific. You mm-hmm. know, they were said Army of Occupation, so uh-huh. they must have been doing good over there. You know, they yeah, must yeah. have been doing good at that time. I don't know. We we lost we lost contact with that of the uh, of the Pacific thing. But what happened was, we got all set to go uh, to uh, uh, become the the Army of Occupation, and all of a sudden they sent us. Like I said, they sent us to school. And one day this guy comes over, he comes running out of the headquarters, you know, the headquarters, uh, and he's, he's yelling, oh, 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 come on over here. And so we all went over, what happened? So the guy says, uh, the U.S. dropped a bomb in Nagasaki, or was it? Hiroshima yeah, and Nagasaki. Hiroshima. It's just it leveled the whole town. Get out of here, will you go, go tell your fairy tales on where I get down and try to build up our spirit or what, you know, and all that stuff. <laughs> now, just before that, just just before that he came out, like a few days before, we already now, uh, my daughter has the duffel bag. We have a duffel bag and we had a personal bag, right? Mm-hmm. And, they, and we all gathered, and, and we went to, uh, they um, took us on trucks, and they took us to uh, uh, Bremerhaven. We went to Bremerhaven. I was we all lined up, the whole division's lined up, with one, two bags, and that's it, you know, nothing else. Your rifle and two bags. And they says, okay, you put your uh, bags and your uh, rifles on here and all that stuff, and leave them there. Nobody will touch them. You've got some guards here, and nobody will touch anything. Okay, so we left them there, and, and they had some kind of a, 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 a powwow, I guess it was, and we were waiting outside. And we were all set to go home. Come home. We were going to come home, and then we were going to go. Well, first of all, they, first of all, they took all the high, high uh, number guys. We had they had a point system, and if you were married, and you had you were married, it was so many points. If you had children, it was so many points. If you were a uh, uh, single, it was, but you uh, served uh, like three three years or four years, you know, like a seniority thing they had. <laughs> I was on the bottom of the list. We were on the bottom of the list, though, most of our guys, you know. So they had started that nonsense. And uh, when they dropped the bomb, they came right to the field. They said, pick up your uh, your bag with your personal things and leave the other bag there. They took our place. They even took our patch, our 69th patch. You know, on the, mm-hmm. with the uniform, with the patch on it. They yeah. took the, you guys are not 69 members, they were from all the other, all the other units. And they, they came home and we stayed. <laughs> Imagine that. I said, this is something. This, I, I never heard of this one before. This was like a mass turnover, you know. They, they, I guess the bombs in, in Japan turned the whole thing around. That was the end of it. And then so you... they came home. And I went to, and we got uh, separate. We got uh, with the guy that took our spot. It was the, we uh, we took their spot. And I went to an ordnance office after. I didn't know anything about an ordnance. I was. I was uh, in charge of, uh, I, uh, I was a T5. It was like, almost like a general for Colonel. I was a T5 in charge of a unit that was, I had to make sure that all the, G, all the equipment was oiled, had oil in, in, in the engines and all that stuff, because they were shipping them out. Mm-hmm. 
that's what happened with, uh, with my job. And I was, I was in charge of the shipping out of equipment. Now when we ran out of Jeeps, now we went to the three-quarter ton trucks, then we went to the six buys, <laughs> and, and slowly but surely it wound up, we got rid of all, we were getting rid of all the equipment because now the war was officially over. It was September, you know, and uh, <laughs> got rid of all that. All the U.S. equipment was going home. And all we kept was our own little, what, what we needed there, you know? Yeah. And we had tanks. We were shipping tanks out. We were shipping, uh, you name it. I would learn how to drive a, I learned how to drive a duck. You know them ducks? Huh? Yep. <laughs> you don't know what I would have. I drove one of those. I drove a, I drove almost every vehicle they had. They had a bulldozer one day. I was a bulldozer and then right thing, job thing. I, I'm telling you something. But I learned all that stuff. And then they shipped me from the, from maintenance, and they shipped me to a town called Wetzlar. You know where they make the the lenses yep. for all the cameras and things? They shipped me to Wetzlar, mm -hmm. and uh, from Wetzlar, that's why I got my uh, my vacation to Rome. And then when I come home, I came back. They said, "No, you're not. You you've been transferred." I said, "Where am I now?" The guy says, you were with the 137th Ordinance, 137th Ordinance. We were going around examining all the all the vehicles that were going home. We had to make sure they were all, you know, uh, rigged up to go home. And then we were from the 137th Ordinance, I went to the 910th Ordinance, which was the heavy ordinance. The first ones were the light ordinance, this was heavy ordinance. We got to, and that's when I spent my whole my all my time there. But I got sent to a, a beautiful town there. I gotta say that for the army. They sent me. They sent me to uh, Friedberg, mm -hmm. not Freiburg. There's two of them. There's Freiburg and there's Friedberg. Friedberg. Uh, Friedberg is a l nice little town, like it's just like the USA. That's what it reminded me of. There's stores. Yeah, they had the tree in the in the middle of the town, you know, nice little roadways, and and that's what we did. We went there, and I was like the king, king tut there, you know. <laughs> Everybody come to come to me. You must, are you sergeant or am I? I'm not a sergeant. I'm corporal, corporal. No, you're a sergeant. No, I'm corporal. I was chief, chief uh, five. They used to mistake that for a sergeant. When did you finally come back to the states? After the war, what? When did you come back to the states? After I came the war? back to the states. It was um, I. I got discharged. Came back to the states again on a, a victory ship. I, I couldn't believe it. Everybody else was telling me how uh, they went over on on these boats. Uh, uh, the steamers that the uh, big steam. They were there in three, four days. It took, it took me twelve days to come home. I swear to God. I mean, I. I had a guy who was with a kid from Connecticut. We were together, you know, coming home. He said, where are we going? I don't know. Just taking a long time to get home. Twelve days from from uh, Germany. Twelve wow. days. That's a long time. The thing was like an old, uh, like old bug deployment on the East you know? Yeah. And at the home, it was uh, June. Uh, I see. It was June of 1946. And what did you do after the war? After you came home? What? What did you do after the war when you came home? Oh, when I came home, I applied for uh, college. I wanted to go uh, to NYU. Yep. And uh, I wanted to get, uh, I went there to register. And I couldn't afford it. Oh. Could not afford it. It was only a few hundred dollars in those days to get into college, and you know, the government was backing you up. Couldn't afford college, and uh, I was uh, doing a little auto mechanic work, auto electric work, and I worked for an outfit in, in Jamaica called Fogarty Brothers, and he uh, he took me in, and I was under the GI Bill. Yeah. They were paying part of my salary or whatever. Oh. And it was nice, you know, it was good. 
and I learned the I learned the ins and outs, and I, I did pretty good. And then I I hooked up with my buddy who was in the Philippines. He came home and he was discharged. Uh, we both grew up and 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 we went to school together and everything. A guy by the name of Dino Grappi. And uh, we were gonna buy. We wanted to get together and buy a, a gas station. And. Uh, Right near Dick's Hills there, right by the railroad. Mm -hmm. What a beautiful place. So the two guys owned it. Yeah. And they wanted out. They wanted out. They said, you get the money from the government, you got yourself a station, 5,000 bucks. When I heard 5,000 bucks, I said, who ever heard of that $5,000? <laughs> Nobody ever heard that kind of money then, yeah? So we went there. Well, we tried. So we went to the VA in uh, 7th Avenue. They had a big VA in Seventh Avenue in New York. Mm -hmm. Went in there, and uh, I tell you, they're kind of surly. They, I mean, they treat us like, you know, what, are you, what the hell are you guys doing here? Yeah. So I finally got uh, interviewed by somebody, and he says to us, "You got to go to the bank, and you got to try your best to get it from a bank." He said. So we went to a bank. In fact, two or three banks, and we spoke to the people there. And they, the first thing they ask you, "What do you got for collateral?" <laughs> what, what could I have for collateral? I'm 18 years old. I was in the army for two years. And now, what the hell do I have for collateral? A pair of shoes? <laughs> didn't, have, didn't have a nickel. Yeah. I mean, we had a couple of bucks and so. So we went. We we bought uh, we tried all different routes, and we tried the parents and the parents didn't have that kind of money, you know. Mm -hmm. So I went to school. I went to school and I learned the auto electric in Mini Mineola, out here in Mineola. It's an auto electric school. A guy by the teacher was a guy by the name of Mr. Perebnoy. Mm -hmm. I never heard of a name like that in my life. What I should say in Russian again? <laughs> Perebnoid, and uh, he was a good guy. He, he says to me, you're pretty sharp. He says, I'm going to get you a job with the uh, Fogarty Brothers. And that's when I did. Running low on juice here. Went off? Nope. Um, so um, we're just, and then after that you went into the sanitation department? What? You went into the sanitation department? Yeah, uh, I was working for uh, Fogarty Brothers, mm -hmm. right, and uh, in Jamaica, and uh, and we used to get one week vacation, one week vacation, and uh, five and a half days a week. Mm -hmm. I said, what the, hell, what the hell am I doing here? You know, so I asked uh, the Fogarty, the boss. I says, if uh, can we work? Can I work for you on a, on a uh, you know? commission basis or something so I can make more money. I said, I'm not going anywhere. He says, uh, I, he says I can't afford anything else. So you have to do what you got to do, you know. And I stuck it out for about a year, I think I was there. And uh, and that year, and my friend there, that uh, he was going to uh, school too, and he was learning how to be a bookmaker, you know. So we were staying out together, and he says to me, I hear the sanitation department hiring. First, no, first I, the truth, first I went to the police. I wanted to be a policeman, right? So I had a girlfriend whose father was a cop. And she says, if you, if you, if you want to go out with me, she says, you cannot be a cop. He said, we'll never get married being a policeman. And how long were you with the sanitation department for? So I, I was with the sanitation 32 years. Wow. When I went in there. But that, that part about the cop, I, want, I married that girl. <laughs> <laughs> nine years. I caught it. <laughs> nine years. On, off, on, off, on, off. You a cop? No, I'm not a cop. <laughs> If I was a cop, I never would have got married. I couldn't get married. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Vincent. Um...
I want to thank you for um, sharing your story with me today. You're welcome. Um, You're welcome. It's thank you. Nice telling the story. Huh? And uh, uh, do you have any final words you wish to say um, before yeah. we finish? Thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you. Listening to listening to the, to the long liturgy. Oh, it's perfect. Thank you. You're welcome.